Hello, everybody. Uh, starting promptly right at 6.30 Pacific Standard Time. I, uh, I know a lot of you are joining us from all over the world, so it may be 6.30 for me, but uh, it could be 9.30 or a lot later for you guys. Um, so thanks for joining me today. My name is Caitlin Proctor, and I am the founder of PT Exam Prep. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys today about three stations and all the safety fails that can come with those stations. Um, before I begin, I just want to do a few little kind of housekeeping things. So um, I'm going to put down everybody's hand. Uh, if you can hear me, please put up your hand. Uh, you'll see it if you're using um, any type of iPad or iPhone or any type of mobile device, it just be the hand icon. So I'll get everyone to throw their hand up for me so that they know I'm talking. Good, good, good. Good, seeing lots of you guys put your hands up. <clears throat> so if any of you guys are confused about where the hand uh, sign is there it really should uh, it just looks like a high five but anyways um, so good I know you guys can hear me the majority of you have put your hands up so I'm gonna throw all your hands down <clears throat> Sorry, um, there's a lot of you guys here today. We have uh, almost 200 of you guys here today. So it's a very, very big session. Um, so I am, of course, gonna be keeping everyone muted. Um, there may be times, if we if we have times, that I will unmute some of you. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of how today is gonna go, uh, I'm going to just start to get to know you guys a little bit. We're gonna jump right into it. And at the end, we're gonna have some time for questions and answers, okay? So thanks to all you who jumped on here pretty early um, and wrote down uh, where they're from um, and what their least favorite thing to study is. So it looks like we have people from all over here. A lot of you guys, I'd say you know, 90% of you are in Canada. Uh, we've got some fun ones. Uh, we've got Paris or else we have quite a few places in India. We have quite a few places in Australia. Um, a lot of Vancouver, a lot of places in Ontario. This is great, lots of you guys here. All righty, so I wanna get to know a little bit more about you guys. Um, if any of you have joined my webinars before, you know that it's, it's helpful for me to know you guys because then I can make sure that I'm um, telling you the right information for where the majority of you guys are in your preparation. So the first poll that I am going to put up here um, is which practical exam are you planning on taking? <clears throat> this is super exciting. So as I said, we have almost 200 of you here. Uh, I'm gonna stop the poll in around two, one, okay, closing the poll. I wanna show you guys this. So the majority of you guys are doing the November exam. So that's that's really great. Um, then of course we have some Junes and then some Novembers. But yeah, the majority of you guys, uh, your exam's right around the corner. Okay, uh, which province are you living in while preparing? Okay, pretty good split here. I'm gonna close it in three, two, one, closing the poll. So you guys can see it's a pretty even split. Uh, oh no, I'm totally lying. Nope, it's not an even split. A lot of you guys are from Ontario, uh, BC's next, Alberta, uh, and a few in the Maritimes. Cool, I know I didn't include all the provinces there, um, but at least good to see where some of you guys are from. Really important question, do you have a study partner? Okay, I'm gonna close the poll here. So this is interesting for me. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, if we add that up, we have around 30% that are either no or only virtually, um, and then 70% that are face-to-face. -face. Um, so I definitely am just gonna encourage all of you guys go into this uh, PT Exam Prep Student Forum on Facebook. Um, please, you know, write where you're from, see if you guys can find someone else. Uh, it, it's, it's really important to get to study with someone face to face, so super important. Okay, few more questions here. How ready are you for your upcoming practical exam? <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, five, four, three, two, one. So uh, interesting with this, I don't get to see who clicked on what. I would love to see who says I'm ready to take the exam. I'd love to quiz you and um, you know make sure that you're totally ready. 55% 50, of you <clears throat> feel like you'll be ready by exam time. So that's good, that's what we wanna see. We don't want you to be too ready too early um, you know the somewhat ready and I'll be ready by exam time are, are kind of similar um, and then not ready at all 14% of you so I don't love that hopefully you guys are the ones that are writing next June or November uh, okay last question here for you guys um, are you currently enrolled in a course <clears throat> okay, I know there's a lot to read there. Just give you a few more seconds. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep coughing, guys. I know it's annoying. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. So just to see there, it looks like um, a lot of you guys are in our course, our full course. That's great. Uh, a lot of you wish you would have. I know. Uh, I, I apologize to anyone there who uh, wanted to take the course, but we didn't have space available. Um, we do sell it every year, so I, I, I know there'll be some angry people emailing me always after the webinar asking if we can somehow make a course for them. Um, but yeah, okay, lots of the practical crash course, and then those 10% that are confident that they got it on their own. All righty, let's get into this. So, first thing I want to talk to you about is automatic fails, okay? So before we get talking about specific stations, I want to talk to you about the three automatic fails that apply for every single station. Um, so sorry, for those of you who have not been to a webinar with me before, I talk very quickly. Uh, so just be aware, uh, I'll take your questions at the end, so please stick around. But Okay, the first thing that we want to go over is definitely know, you know, those three main things in your station. And the first one that I want to talk to you about is gaining consent. Now, gaining consent has multiple layers to it. We don't have time today to go over the full process, but if you do your proper introduction that you were taught in either the crash course or our full course, um, you know you'll have met the requirements for consent, okay? So really important, gain consent at every single station. Okay. Some stations, you know, purely are around just obtaining consent, uh, whether it's a tricky station that um, it's, you know, someone who isn't cognitively aware, um, if it's a younger child. So there, there have been uh, situations where, you know, you need to know that. Um, so the next one that I, of course, want you to know is that you need to check the brakes. So this is very important and it needs to be stated out loud. So it's not enough to just, you know, look, make sure the red uh, stop is on. You really need to say it out loud and always make sure that your patient is in a safe position before checking the brakes. We always encourage our students um, to have the patient either sitting on the bed, arms braced on the back of the bed as you're putting the brakes on, okay? And the last one is ask station specific contraindications and precautions. So a few stations that I always suggest you listing contraindications before treating are, get your pens out, uh, postural drainage positioning, percussions, vibrations, and rib springing, and joint mobilization stations. So again, that's postural drainage positioning, percussions, vibrations, rib springing, and joint mobilization. We cover these in details in the course, but for those of you who are not taking it, I would make sure that you make up a list of contraindications for each of those stations and practice that with your partners. Again, whether you are face-to-face -face or virtual, super important to be practicing this, okay? Let's go over our first station. So our first station is a 10 minute station. What's gonna happen here, guys, is I'm gonna place the station up onto the screen. You're gonna have a two minute timer set and I want you to write down every single safety precaution you think uh, needs to be addressed, okay? So really important, I want you to break them down, uh, you know, write one beside it, two beside it, three beside it. Um, so when you guys are ready, I'm gonna start the timer. Here we go.
All right, so that is two minutes. So I know a few of you guys are writing your answers in the chat box. Don't You don't need to do that. Um, you just wanted to write it down for yourself. So <clears throat> we're gonna start going through these situations and I want you to cross off on your list, okay? How many of those um, safety precautions you had. So I want you to individually count. So for example, if you said, you know, hit precautions, that would be one. How many safety fails did you count for the station? And for this, please do type it in the, in the chat. I wanna see what you guys are getting. So just a number, I only wanna see a number. How many did you write down? Good, so we got six, two, nine, five, six, ten, six, seven, eight, five. Good, 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 eight. 10, 13, 10, 6. Okay, so we're, everyone's kind of around, we have one 16 out there, uh, but most of the other ones kind of are around that 10 or less. All right, here we go, let's talk about them. So first I'm gonna get you guys to watch a video, okay? Now, some of you guys may have seen this, it's about a two minute video, but it's just about how to address a mobilization station, okay? Sorry. Right. Well, I hope you uh, forgive me for my poor acting skills. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a really great framework to use for any first time mobilization stations. But what I want to do here is to take that and make it specific for this station. So one of the big things that you need to think about when we're looking at this question about hip replacements and mobilizing a patient is asking the screening questions, okay? So as a reminder of those screening questions, the first one is you want to ask the patient if it's their first time getting up um, and, you know, have they been up before moving around, okay? Somehow word that. Uh, the next thing that you want to ask them is uh, before your surgery, were you using any walking aids? Super important. For the hip replacement station, uh, you want to get the patient 
uh, using a walker, a standard walker, that's kind of general general precautions when you're getting them up for the first time. Uh, but if this patient was using something more than that, then you need to be aware, okay? Uh, even if the patient was, say, using nothing, we still want to get them using a, a standard walker, all right? Next, let's talk about the last question. That's, are you experiencing any pain or dizziness? Okay, so questions that you absolutely have to ask. So there, we're gonna say that's kind of point one um, in our multiple points of the station. So next, we wanna explain the hip precautions. Now, this looks like one that a lot of you guys wrote down, so that's really, really great, but we need to be, sorry I got quite a few of you saying that you couldn't hear the video I'm just seeing that um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you an email afterwards uh, and it'll have the link to the video so you guys can all watch it again okay um, but the next one that we want to talk about is hip precautions now with hip precautions we need to do more than just stay to the patient you know no hip flexion no internal rotation uh, we need to be really really specific for them so what I want you to say is you know you cannot bend your Hip, bend your knee past 90 degrees. Examples of how you might do this is if you're sitting too low at the edge of the bed. Um, and so I want you to sit so your bum is higher than your knee. Give them a practical example of what that looks like, okay? Next, um, you want to think about adduction past midline, mid, past midline. So what that can mean too is if they're crossing their legs during a transfer, this could break those precautions. So ensure that you have your pillows between their knees, um, especially if you're choosing to log roll the patient. Okay. You could also give them a really good practical idea of um, what this looks like, and it would just be if their patient is crossing their legs and sitting. Uh, the last one is internal rotation. So this could be them just laying in bed with their toes falling inwards um, or once you get them standing when you go to do a turn you always want to turn away from the affected side turning towards the affected side while mobile mobilizing is going to lead them uh, to internally rotate that leg so always turn away and things that you need to state when you're mobilizing them so when you get to that uh, halfway point and you're turning around say I'm let's turn towards your affected side that we're avoiding uh, causing internal rotation on your uh, post-surgical side. Okay, super important. So we're gonna give each of those uh, another mark. So that's four now we're at for a total of four safety fails that you could possibly get. Next thing we're gonna do is we are going to check the wound. Now this is a controversial um, kind of point amongst the courses, something I really wanted to bring to your guys' attention um, because even in our course, this is something new that we have added. We want you guys to check the wound. What checking the wound looks like is you're going to expose the area, but you don't need to take the bandages off, okay? So if they're wearing um, a gown, just say, I just want to um, remove this so that I can go and take a look. And I'm looking to see uh, if there's any leaking or bleeding or oozing on the bandage, if there's any abnormal redness around the dressing, if there's any red streaking around the dressing. You don't need to take the bandage off, okay? I repeat, do not take the bandage off and inspect the actual incision. We just want you to acknowledge that infections can occur postoperatively, and we're clearing this as a safety precaution, okay? You also can ask them, are you feeling feverish or ill? This is a really good follow-up station for five by five minute stations as well, um, is you know, what possible complications could happen, what can we do about that? I definitely wanna check the wound, okay? Um, other stations you might see this in would be a total knee replacement as well, especially if the question states that they're coming into, say, your private or outpatient clinic. Um, is something you wanna look at. When they're in hospital, it isn't as important, um, but still something that we wanna think about, okay? So next, let's go uh, to our next point, and that is checking for a DVT, okay? Now, our next safety fail comes from not checking for a DVT, and remember this needs to be checked in any patient who is mobilizing for the first time or any patient who is experiencing pain in their lower calf. Super important. Now there's five tests that we want you to do. And again, this is in that video. I apologize um, to those who could not hear it. Um, so let's go through those DVT checks, okay? So just to, to um, update our count, we're at five safety fails for this station. So our, our six safety fails talking about the DVT check. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna ask, 
Are you currently experiencing any pain in your calves? Then you're gonna expose the area. Remember, look at both legs. Next, you're gonna evaluate, is there any redness or swelling? Palpate for feet. And last, test using the Homan's test. For this, we passively dorsiflex the ankle and ask if they have any pain in their calf, okay? Again, super important, we're gonna ask, are you currently experiencing any pain in either of your calves? Expose the area, look at both legs in the calf, Oh, you're gonna evaluate to see if there's any redness or swelling, palpate for heat, and then use the test of the Homan's test by passively dorsiflexing the ankle and ask if they have any pain in their calf. All right, so we're up to six safety fails for this station now. Let's see who's gonna get this right. Next thing that we want to do is we want to test key muscle strength, okay? If you do not test key muscle strength, it's not necessarily a safety fail. However, there is a sneaky safety fail in this. So I'm gonna get you guys to write in the chat box, what um, muscles do you want to check in the lower extremity? Anyone, anyone? Okay, I'm getting a ton of hip flexors. Awesome, awesome, yep, great. How are we gonna test hip flexors? I see a few people here. Okay, I got some marching. I got knee extensors, I got lots of marching, marching on the spot, hip flexors, knee extension, knee extension, knee kicks, knee kicks. Okay, so here's the tricky thing with the station, guys. Do not march. If you get them to march in the seated position, which I hope you would be to test them because you don't want them in standing, um, when you're testing for that grade three muscle strength, they cannot march or they will be breaking 90 degrees, okay? So I see a lot of you guys writing marching lift the thigh off bed super super not good to do because that is a safety fail okay so what we want them to do is we want them to extend the knee in the sitting position and again make sure that they're sitting on something uh, or the bed is high enough that they are not um, breaking that 90 degrees so often what we get them to do is we raise the bed quite a bit get them to uh, scoot right to the edge of the bed so they're not at 90 degrees and then we'll get them to extend their knees now some patients balance isn't good enough if their legs are kind of barely touching so make sure you're giving them good support there all right Next thing, uh, sorry, next thing that we want to check is we want to check uh, the upper extremity strength. So for this, we'll check using triceps, we can de-weight their bum and check grip strength, squeezing their fingers. So you must check upper extremity strength because they will be using a walker, okay? Super, super important. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check for footwear. So if they do not have shoes, um, you that's okay uh, you can use those socks that have the sticky bottoms um, or if they have untied shoes you want to make sure they're tying but does anyone know what the safety fail is around shoes in this station type it in the chat box if you know Okay, so a lot of you guys are saying slippery socks, untied laces, um, wearing flip-flops, no socks, loose layers, Okay, okay, so I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. The safety fail around footwear is if you ask them to put on their own shoes. So say the patient um, has their shoes there where they need to be tied, uh, you need to do it for them. Going and putting on their own shoes unless they're able to kind of slide their foot in, which we don't really want them to use while mobilizing anyways, um, that's gonna mean that they're flexing forward towards their feet, breaking that 90 degrees. Okay, again, another really, really important safety fail. We're up to six, seven, eight safety fails now. Um, you want to make sure that you are not allowing them to bend down and tie their own shoes, okay? So if in the station they do not have shoes on, but they are beside them, I want you to state out loud, I am gonna put your shoes on for you because at this point I don't want you leaning forward and breaking 90 degrees. Okay. Other things that you might want to do is if there's a shoehorn in the station, you could show them that. Um, but if the station is not testing for that, you're wasting time, you're wasting those precious um, moments. So I would expect you to put it on for them. Okay, so uh, should we put the shoes on? I see a quick question I just want to address. Should we put the shoes on for a normal patient? No, this is only because they're a hip replacement patient and we don't want them bending past that 90 degrees. Okay, so Next one that we're gonna look at here, 
is using a transfer belt. So if you don't use a transfer belt, this is another safety fail, okay? So we're up to nine for this station. So not using a transfer belt, um, if there isn't one in a room, you need to state that you would use it and you need to stay close to the patient, okay? So super important, again, if there is a transfer belt, you must use it. If there's not a transfer belt in the room, state that you would use it, okay? Um, some other questions I'm seeing here is, can I test the lower extremity strength in supine? Yeah, you could, um, but we're looking for grade three muscle strength. Remember that. So you need to be a little bit creative then in how you're testing. Um, is barefoot okay? Barefoot is not ideal. Uh, if they have shoes and they have good supportive shoes, ideally we want to put those on. Okay. Can I put the shoes on even before transferring the patient from supine to sit position? Totally you can. Yep, no problem. Okay, let's keep going here. So set up a chair, okay? This is really, really important. This is our 10th safety fail for this station. You need to set up a, a chair um, on the other side of the room. Anything specific about this chair, guys? I'm gonna let you write that in the chat, in the box. Okay, so I see a few of you guys saying you need a high chair. Yeah, you need a high chair. What about if there's not a high chair? I'm loving that a lot of the people that I'm recognizing here are saying the right answer. I'm not saying it out loud, but I see a lot of you guys heard it. Awesome. So you need to put a pillow or a cushion on that chair, okay? Simply putting a chair um, at the other side of the room um, is not enough. The OSCE station is most likely not going to have a high chair, so you need to put that cushion or that pillow on the chair, okay? So as much as a safety fail would be not setting up a chair, you also need to have that pillow on a chair, okay? So we're up to 11 now. Great. So next, if your patient reports dizziness, what would you do? So this is a is an interesting one because um, you know we're taught to always check in. Are you feeling any pain? Are you feeling dizziness? So this is another um, kind of sneaky safety fail, if you will, is if you're not asking the patient about dizziness. Um, that's not good, but if the patient does report dizziness, you know, what should you do? So what we advise all of our students to do is to stop, wait 10 seconds, and then ask again. If they're still dizzy, get them back into bed in a safe position, in a chair, supine's a great position. If it goes away, then continue with your station, but be sure to recheck often, okay? So great, so that brings us to a total of 11 safety fails for that station. So let's see if there's anyone here who gets a, a bit of a shout out. So yeah, Michelle, we got a good one. Simrat, awesome job. Any other 11s? No, oh, I'm searching, I'm searching. No, it's so only you two, good job. Um, it's, it's definitely a lot of safety fails for the stations. Um, and, and you know, mobilizing someone after a hip replacement is something that I really, really want all of you guys to feel super confident in, okay? Great. So let's go on to our next question. Mobilizing a patient with a chest tube. So again, I'm going to give you two minutes to read the question. I want you to write down all the safety fails that you can think of for the station when you're ready. So it should say upon entering the room, he is supine. <clears throat> All right, we are going to keep going. So let's take a look. First, you need to check the integrity of the site, okay? Ask the patient if you can view the site. Do not remove the bandages. Ask if they've been feeling feverish or ill and ensure there is no infection. So really going back to those first steps that we were talking about, okay? 
super important. Again, we really need to just investigate that we understand or we state that we understand that um, having an infection is an issue. So make sure we check that. All right, next thing. Oh, sorry, I wrote these all down. So ask the patient if you can view the site. Do not remove the bandages. Ask if they've been feeling feverish or ill and ensure there is no infection. Next, we're gonna set up the chest tube. So again, really important, and this is the big safety fail for this station, okay? Vocalize absolutely everything. I'm going to set yourself and the room up to ensure you do not roll directly onto the tube, okay? Verbalize that, please. Next, you're gonna set up the chest tube before moving. So this is gonna require you to not lift the tube above the insertion site and do not knock over the container. Full disclosure here, guys, that was something I was so bad at when I was practicing. I would always knock over the container. I don't know if it was my nervous feet, but I always somehow found to connect my foot to the container and just kick it. So practice this station, really important. As much as you don't wanna lift the tube above the insertion site, you also wanna make sure that that container is stable, okay? So here's the tricky thing about this question. I'm gonna just zoom back to the question here. So let's see, it's saying that your patient has a hemothorax after a puncture wound, okay? Upon entering the room, he is supine with a chest tube on his left side. The bed is pushed up against the wall on his right side, meaning that you have to mobilize the patient towards the chest tube side. Really, really tricky station, okay? I hope you guys all saw that, but kind of going through these really quickly. What I want you to do is practice a proper lay to sit, okay? So be careful. What you need to do in this situation, this is Aaron Reeds, by the way, one of our wonderful teachers, um, and that Lululemon bag with a, a tube there is our chest tube, so it's on our left side. What we're wanting her to do here is we're wanting her to lift up the head of the bed, okay? So that's what you're gonna do for the patient is lift up the bed. The next thing you're gonna get them to do is just simply place their arm under their body so that they're propping themselves up. So you can see if I go from here to here, that insertion site is not getting affected, okay? So make sure that they're able to use their arm to support their trunk to come up. Next thing we're going to do here is we're going to just get them to press themselves up into sitting. So that's what that proper mobilization with a chest tube from supine to sit should look like, okay? Super important, again, that you guys are catching that this station required you to transfer towards the side of the chest tube. All right. So next thing with this station is the transfer belt placement. A really important safety feel here is if you put the transfer belt on the insertion site. So again, we are not in any ways putting any pressure on that tube, okay? So we wanna keep it away. We're gonna place it above or below. It's usually going to be below, um, but just know that it may not be the ideal situation. And just say that. This is not the ideal placement of my transfer belt, but with your chest tube, I wanna make sure um, that we're not uh, compressing it. So this is where we're gonna go, okay? I'm just gonna check in with a few of the questions here. Da, da, da. So some people are asking if they can push the container under the bed. I do not suggest this. I suggest having the, the, um, the container where you can see it and just make sure you have good management of it, okay? Uh, I'm not sure what the second point is that you want me to go over. And do you splint or cover the tube area to protect it while sitting up? Nope, you don't wanna put any pressure on it. So you are getting the patient to move by not putting any pressure, okay? So as far as the uh, transfer belt placement, a few of you guys have been asking about that, we just wanna make sure that it's e not on the actual insertion site. Usually it's going to be below the insertion site, okay? Should we split the chest tube site? No. Can we skip putting the transfer belt on altogether? No, you need to have a transfer belt when you're mobilizing someone. And how do you roll a patient to the opposite side? Uh, nice, good question. Unfortunately, that's not something that we're gonna be able to uh, go over. That's a fairly simple station though. Um, if you are in one of the courses, ask your teacher, they will go over that for you. But it's a pretty easy station to transfer away from the side, okay? All righty. 
So I'm going to keep going through here. I do see a few more questions, but for the transfer build again, keep it away from the insertion site. It may not be in the ideal position, but that's okay. All right, the next thing is we want to hook the canister to the walker or the IV pole if it's available. If not, you have to hold it and you have to manage the patient. So be careful with that. Okay, of course, again, set up the chair and put on shoes. Not as tricky as the hip precaution station, um, but definitely something that you want to make sure you're doing. Okay, great. So we're going on to our last question in this series here. Um, I apologize to anyone who wanted to get out of here right at 7.15. Oh my gosh, I even tried to make this one shorter today so I wouldn't go over, but uh, apparently I just like to talk too much. Um, so just checking in with the final questions here. I just have to click on this. If you're mobilizing a patient, how do you manage the chest tubes as you are walking? Good question. So placing it on uh, the walker or IV pole as we have there. Uh, what do you do if you have to move the tube to the other side of the bed and the tubing isn't long enough? Uh, they should absolutely not do this to you. Uh, if the event, in the event that they had to do this to you, we suggest getting them up into sitting um, and just moving it around the bed with them. Uh, but really, really, I don't think that they would do this to you. Can the patient put on their shoes? Yeah, no problem. Do we still check DVT and key muscle strength? So remember what that, I don't know if you got to see the video, Rebecca, but um, in the video that I'm going to send you guys afterwards, I promise I will send it to you. Um, you know, you need to check three things always with a patient who's mobilizing for the first time. If it's their first time mobilizing, you need to check DVT um, and you need to check key muscle strength. Always in a mobilization station, check muscle strength. Okay. What side do we choose to walk on? I always say the weak side. If they don't have a weak side, it's not really that important. It's probably easier to manage the chest tube if you're on the same side. Okay. So uh, one more question here, going back to DVT, I was told it's not safe and not a reliable test. Um, unfortunately, Jennifer, the problem with uh, some of the things that the Alliance tests uh, is they're not always true in clinical practice. Um, I do not work in private practice, I can check, or public practice, I can check with some of my teachers to see if this is still practice in the hospital. However, I am confident that this is still something that you need to do for the exam, okay? Is a transfer belt contraindicated for acute surgical cases like laminectomy? Uh, you'll have to use your clinical judgment on this one. If you're putting any of uh, that kind of circumferential pressure on them, then something you need to be careful of. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. That's all we're going to have time for for that station. Next, we're going to go into the subjective history station. Okay, we're going to go through this one a little quicker. So I'm not going to give you guys those two minutes here. We're just going to talk through this because there's lots for this subjective history station. So your patient is 55 years old. They're complaining of low back pain that started approximately six weeks ago and they have no mechanisms of injury. So um, what I want you to do here is perform a subjective history. So with this station, things that we need to think about, we definitely need to ask our red flag cancer questions. So you guys should all know these, right? Let's see them in the chat box. Good, so we're getting lots of people. Our red flag cancer questions, night pain, night sweats, good, unexplained weight loss, okay? So I don't see anyone that wrote actually unexplained weight loss. I see you guys saying weight loss. Make sure that when you're asking your questions, you say, are you experiencing pain at night? Are you experiencing sweating at night? And are you experiencing unexplained weight loss? Super important that you are caveating that with unexplained, okay? Uh, if you're like me, I would love to experience weight loss. If it was unexplained, not so much. All right, mandatory lower spine questions. Okay, our lumbar spine questions. So with this, we have quite a few questions that we need to ask. So bilateral numbness and weakness we're looking for. We want to see if they have saddle paresthesia. Now remember, there are marks given in these stations for asking your patient in layman's terms. So how would you ask if a patient had saddle paresthesia? Yeah, I love that. Tanya, you said exactly how I say in clinical practice. So do you have numbness in the area where you would sit on a bicycle seat? Great. I see quite a few of you saying that. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
I wonder where that came from. Does anyone know where that came from? Probably came from someone super smart, like McGee or something. Um, yeah, so I see a few of you guys saying sensation in, in private areas or what, uh, when you go to the bathroom, do you feel it? Um, things that, that I would say uh, would be more along the lines of, uh, yeah, do you have numbness or tingling in the area when you sit on a toilet seat? Oh my gosh, that's so funny, or uh, on a bicycle seat. I'm sorry, I got distracted because a lot of you guys are saying that the PT prep course taught you that. And <laughs> clearly my my weird saying has caught on. So yes, okay, that's great. That's what I say, so perfect. You guys can say it too. That's awesome. Okay, so next thing that we're gonna ask them is if they have any bowel or bladder changes or difficulties, okay? This one's pretty self-explanatory to a patient. You know, uh, are you having issues here? We need to talk about it. Next is the C-spine questions. Now I know this station did not ask for L-spine, um, or sorry, did not ask for cervical spine questions. It was purely a low back station, but I just wanna make sure that you guys are aware of your C-spine questions to avoid uh, safety fails. So five Ds, you guys should all know these super easy, right? Dizziness, diplopia, drop attacks, dysphagia, dysarthria. Um, again, when you're asking your patients, you're gonna say, are you experiencing any dizziness? Do you have double vision? Do you have loss of consciousness ever when looking up? Do you have problems swallowing or problems speaking? Do not say dysphagia. They don't know what that is. That's not layman's terms. You're not going to get full marks, okay? So then we also have our three ends. Our ends are nystagmus, nausea, vomiting, and neurological symptoms, okay? Again, super important to ask your mandatory questions. <clears throat> now, this is something that I want to uh, kind of draw your guys' attention to as just a big laundry list of signs and symptoms of serious pathology. So in your subjective history station, if your patient is leading on that any of these things are an issue, I want you to write that on your piece of paper. I want you to remember that. There's most likely gonna be a five by five minute station follow-up question to this, or they're gonna ask you an eight minute mark question to this. So please make sure you're paying attention to it, okay? So what we're looking for here, night pain, night sweats, unexplained weight loss, history of cancer, loss of bowel or bladder control, saddle paresthesia, bilateral numbness, constant pain, pain that isn't related to movement, uh, morning stiffness more than half an hour, and a recent fracture or trauma, okay? big signs that something is seriously going on here. So I want you guys to draw, I want you to know these potential red flag pathologies. So when I make up stations for the courses, I usually draw on this list that I'm about to give you here, okay? So whether it's for the lumbar spine or the cervical spine, these stations are really great to trip you up with. So find your partner, uh, take this list, look up a few kind of hints that you would give your patient if you, they were conducting a, a subjective station um, and try to see if they guess it correct, okay? So for the lumbar spine, someone that I want you guys to know those kind of tricky situations are endometriosis, aortic aneurysm, um, pregnancy, and spinal cord tumor. For the cervical spine, we're looking for Pinko's tumor, vertebral artery syndrome, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. <clears throat> so make sure that you guys practice these with your partners and see if you can um, get your partner to guess that that's the pathology that you have. Now, ultimately, what this station is going to be getting at, if there are these serious uh, red flag pathologies, is that you will, need to, you will need to refer them back to their doctor, okay? So things that we're really looking for to refer back to the doctor is if they're having that bladder dysfunction, saddle paresthesia, whoo, fecal incontinence, global progressive upper lower limb weakness, loss of normal gaits, and again, this is non-ataxic because if the patient uh, has a taxic gait, we know that it could be from a, you know, a sprained ankle. Um, but if it's non-ataxic, so non-painful, that's what we're, we're really worried about, okay? Our glove or stocking paresthesia in the limbs, and what should that make you guys think if the patient has glove or stocking paresthesia? Okay, so really, you know, yeah, we're, we're thinking diabetes, GBS, um, not so much a peripheral neuropathy, uh, or sorry, a peripheral nerve pathology. We're more thinking, yeah, diabetes, GBS. Awesome. Okay. 
So let's keep going here. So that's the end of the stations that I want to chat with you guys about. Now I'm gonna go over some questions here, but I just wanted to just go over a few announcements. Um, what's coming up next to PT Exam Prep? We only have a few spots left in our practical crash course. Uh, we've just added some new materials. So if you guys are here and you're in the course, make sure you take a look. Um, in the crash course, we've just added uh, how to prescribe inspiratory muscle training. If you're in the full course, we've added that as well as the sensation manual. The sensation manual is really, really good. So please go over that, okay? Um, what is the practical crash course? For those of you asking, uh, we're just going over common PC questions, very similar to like what we did today, but we're going over more common questions. We're tackling hard, unexpected questions, uh, going over must know topics. There's a video that Erin reads, uh, the one that those uh, pictures were taken of. Uh, she's the teacher in it. She'll have two OSCE stations with answer keys to practice. Um, and there's three one hour live office hours with Erin. Two of them have already happened, but the recording is there for you to watch. All right. Um, so I really want to give a student um, a free registration to our practical course, but I also really want to get some reviews on Facebook. Okay, we have two reviews on Facebook. That's it. I know a ton of you guys are our students, and I would appreciate it so much if you could go uh, to our Facebook page, PT Exam Prep, and just please um, <clears throat> give us a review. And be as honest as you like. Uh, I hope that you guys all love me, but I understand that some people might not. So please just give us a review. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go in on Tuesday next week, and we're going to pick uh, one of those people, and we're going to give uh, the practical crash course for free to them. Now, if you're someone who has already purchased the practical crash course, don't worry. Uh, what we would do in the event that you won is we would just refund you your money, OK? So last thing, I'm oh, sorry, this is what it looks like. I'll also send this to you guys in the email. So I'll send you um, the video, I'll send you uh, the registrations to our next two webinars, and I'll send you uh, the link to this as well, okay? So last, what's coming up next? We have some upcoming webinars for you guys on October 29th at 6.30 PST. We're going over exercise progressions and regressions. And then right before your exam, we're going over mastering those five by five stations. Five by five stations are always reported by students that they are the hardest stations. Uh, so we're gonna go over my kind of golden nugget tips and tricks for that, if you will. Um, yeah, so that's everything I have for you guys here. So thank you so much <clears throat> for joining me today, despite my annoying little cough that I have. Um, I am going to stick around and answer any questions that you guys have. Once you exit the webinar, there's going to be three questions that pop up, pop up on your screen. Um, this topic today was actually given to us by Judith. I know I saw you here. Um, she wanted to. She had a lot of questions about safety fails, and so uh, I put this webinar together for her, it was from a suggestion from students just like you guys. So please give me good suggestions. Something that we always get is ethical situations. No problem, I can do that, but you know, get creative. Let me know things that you're really interested in doing um, and I will do my best to get a webinar going for you guys, okay? Thank you so much for your time. And again, I'm gonna hang around a little bit.